Good evening, everybody. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land upon which we are gathered tonight, the people of the Eastern Kulin Nations. I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging, and extend that respect to any First Nations people here tonight or at home watching. On this unceded land, we are fortunate to celebrate the oldest continuous music practice in the world. Welcome to the first event in a series celebrating women in music in the lead up to International Women's Day on the, March, uh, on the 8th of March. My name is Emma Muir-Smith and I was asked by the MSO to curate the panel and the topic for tonight's discussion. A little bit about me, I studied music at university and I started out my career as an opera singer before branching out and becoming a writer, director um, and other various things in theatre and other multi multidisciplinary works as well. As a freelance artist, I've worked a lot with the MSO over the last few years and all the work that I've done with them has incorporated an art form other than classical music. So while I started out in a space of purely classical music, and that was my training, I'm always thinking about classical music in relation to something else. And something that I think my multidisciplinary work has given me is an insider and outsider perspective on the art form, which has fed into what we'll be thinking about tonight. And so I've put together this group of extraordinary, very different women who have one thing in common. They all have one foot in classical music and one foot somewhere else. And because I'm a bit of a shit stirrer, um, I wanted to interrogate what might be a slightly controversial, but I think actually imperative question. What is the role of classical music in today's society? And is it relevant? Now, obviously, we're gonna be able to nut out this one um, in the next hour, but on the off chance that we fall short of that, I hope that we can explore some ideas that we might not normally talk about and open the door for more conversations in this space going forward. Hopefully this discussion will also spark a bunch of questions for you as our audience. We've got time to answer them at the end, so bookmark them as they come in and we'd love to hear them as we get to them. We'd also love you to join us afterwards for a glass of wine out in the green room. Um, someone had to do a very last minute RSA qualification, so please do stay, make that worthwhile. And so without further ado, I would like to introduce our fabulous panel. Jessica Wells is a composer, orchestrator and arranger. Her music has been performed by symphony orchestras all over Australia and the world. And outside of the purely classical space, she works extensively in film and album recording with her company Jigsaw Music. Next we have Priya Srinivasan, a performer, choreographer and writer whose work is rooted in South Asian classical dance. Among many things, she's the co-artistic director of Sangam, a platform for South Asian artistic excellence, and she's collaborated with the MSO on a number of occasions, including just a few weeks ago at the Maya Music Bowl. Last, we have Sasha Kelly. Sasha started out playing the euphonium in Queensland. I'm sure we'll get to that. Um, but now she's a broadcaster and podcast producer and presenter. She used to produce The Breakfast Show for Classic FM in London. <coughs> And now she's the head of production for finance podcasters, Equity Mates Media. We're also incredibly lucky to have a host who has not only accompanied Jimmy Barnes on the piano, <laughs> but is also our resident cello prodigy. <laughs> Lee Sales AM is a multi-award winning author and journalist at the ABC and anchors the much loved Australian Story Program. Before that, she presented the network's primetime current affairs program, 7.30 for 12 years. She's been the face of the ABC's major events coverage, including federal election and budget nights. Lee has interviewed every living Australian Prime Minister and innumerable world leaders and celebrities from Hillary Clinton and Tony Blair to Paul McCartney and Elton John. She's the author of four books, including the national bestseller, Any Ordinary Day, and her latest, co-written with Annabelle Crabb, Well, Hello. Their wildly popular podcast, Chat 10 Looks 3, has hundreds of thousands of listeners. Please welcome to host and moderate this discussion, Lee Sales. Oh, 
I feel tired when my bio gets read out <laughs> and old. <laughs> um, hi, everybody. I'm very happy to um, be here with you tonight. And the thing that actually piqued my interest to do it, other than that I love classical music, is um, that Emma, we were talking about International Women's Day and how so often um, it'll be a panel of women talking about gender-specific issues. And Emma said, I think it's just interesting to hear women talk about classical music. And, and so I thought, yeah, that's actually a, a, you know, a much, pr um, I think, more interesting way to use that kind of International Women's Day space. Although I will ask some gender-specific um, questions a little bit later. So um, what I wanted to start by asking you all about is how um, musicians and classical music is represented in pop culture. Um, because at the moment, this has been a subject of some discussion because of the film Tar that's out at the moment starring Kate, Kate Blanchett. Um, and there's also the doco that's come out about Simone Young. Um, there's just been a production of Amadeus at the Sydney Opera House. Um, and classical music's often been a kind of rich source of pickings for artists in other disciplines, like I can think of um, An Equal Music by Vikram Seth or the television show Mozart in the Jungle. So um, let me ask all of you, what do you think about the way um, that the world of, of classical music and performance is portrayed in popular culture? Um, let me start with you, Sasha. <laughs> um, well, it's interesting because when you said that to us earlier, I was thinking about Mozart in the Jungle because I loved that series. Obviously, there's things about it that aren't necessarily reflective of what it's like um, or what it's like to be at a conservatorium. But I remember thinking, watching it, the musical director on that show was so good because the oboe excerpts were accurate of what she was actually practicing was what my friend, who was an oboe major, was practicing. And it was the first time that I'd, I mean, there'd be other people who would have been ahead of the game for me, but um, Caroline Shaw was the first time I'd encountered her music. And she's gone on, I mean, she already had an incredible career at that point, but I thought, oh, there's someone behind the scenes here who's actually making this really interesting for, for music nerds as well. But it was interesting while you were saying that, I suddenly thought, I grew up of the generation of American Pie and 40-year-old um, virgin. <laughs> and so it's like, all I got in high school was this one time at band camp. <laughs> and then I also made it on the euphonium, and this is, something that only affects me, but um, the opening montage of 40-Year-Old Virgin, he's playing a euphonium. So it was like, I just can't get a break. Like, it's <laughs> not cool. <laughs> um, so I think it's really interesting because we've just, like, fighting for um, representation that I think is kind of accurate of how great it is, but there's nothing wrong with that. People know what the instruments are, I guess. I, I was actually interview with, um, what was the girl's name who played that girl in American Pie? Alison something her name was. Yeah. She was. There was an interview with her where she said, to this day, constantly, yeah. people go up to her and go, this one time band camp. It's <laughs> yeah. just one of those movie lines that sort of really yeah. cut through. Um, Emma, what about you? Oh, I feel like there's not a lot of representation of classical music in pop culture. The one thing that just keeps coming to me is that episode of The Simpsons where Homer is singing Puccini. Um, and I don't remember the, the exact details, but I, I feel like it's often um, kind of presented as a very other thing that's not mainstream and that's kind of spoken about um, as a little gimmick or a you know, very specific cultural moment. And, um, I think, yeah, it's interesting when we see things like Tar come out that have that as a full, like a whole film devoted to classical music. Have, have any of you seen that? Mm -hmm. Yes. And what, so I'll come to you guys in a sec. But so you two, what did you think of it? I loved it, but um, we actually went together oh, okay. and we had a fight about it. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, okay. All yeah. right. Well, you tell me what you liked about it first. And um, oh, I just thought I thought I had to leave the fact that it was about classical music at the door to an extent, although I know that they used a real orchestra, it was great to see um, musicians, not actors play music, music, musical instruments, but rather musicians just play it and that be in the backdrop. But um, I thought it was an exceptional character study of power and um, gave me a lot to think about. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so, but what did you think then, Emma? Um, Look, I, I was very divided, like within myself by Tar. There were aspects that I really loved and others that I was more critical of, but um, I think some of the filmmaking aspects I was perhaps a bit more critical of rather than the classical music stuff. But I, I felt in general that they tried to maybe fit in a little bit too much, but at the same time, some of it was quite general as opposed to specific. And that, um, 
I don't know. I think because of that, it sort of didn't quite give an accurate representation of a lot of the nuance of the classical music world. Um, but at the same time, I think the, the power aspect of it was very well represented and I think actually scarily accurate from my experience. <laughs> <laughs> um, but before I ask more broadly your thoughts, have either of you seen that film yet? Not yet. Okay. Um, so Priya, what, let me ask you first, what do you think about the way that um, classical music, performing arts is represented in popular culture? Thank you for your question. And I would also like to acknowledge what Emma said earlier that we have been making music and dance on country that is ancient. And so it's really important that we acknowledge we're part of that continuum. Um, and I'm also gonna talk about the fact that I come from a country that is also quite old, India, which has its own traditions and has its own strange history because of colonialism, the ways in which the popular and the classical have actually merged together. I'm sure everyone in this audience has seen something of a Bollywood film and the music inside the Bollywood film actually has its history in classical Indian music. And since we're, it's International Women's Day, the topic, what I wanna point out to many of you who might not know, is that what is hidden in our forms is the a presence of a woman, a, a set of women who were singers and dancers. We didn't have divisions between music and dance and theatre, and so all of it was together, and it was by these women who were um, a particular class and caste of women who became invisible in the histories of music and dance. And when there was a law enacted to prevent them from performing on stages, many of them actually went into films. And so the music, classical music as we know it, is inside all of popular culture within the Indian context. So they are always there, but this absent present. That's really fascinating. So what do you think are the lessons from that that can be drawn, say, for the Western tradition of classical music? Well, I think the first thing is that the hierarchies were cut. There is not this sort of level of class that's implicated of what is classical and what is not. So I think that whole, sort of what I call the vertical hierarchy of what sits on top and what sits on the bottom is reversed when you actually put it in a horizontal plane. So if everything is actually sitting side by side and the classical is equal to the popular, is equal to the folk, the ethnic, all kinds of non-Western forms, what then happens and how do we reimagine ourselves as a truly intercultural nation of which the population, as we all know, is quite diverse now and doesn't, the stages and the music scene doesn't always represent that here in Australia. So because of that um, merging of those two traditions, the classical and the popular, does that mean in, in India, are you more likely to have people who are into all of it? Because say in Australia, you'll have people that maybe, you know, they might go to film, but they would never go to see a classical music concert. And then you might have people that would go to classical music, but they would never want to go to a rock concert. Well, the, as I said, the history is hidden. And therefore, there are still the classical people who will only go to the classical material. But, a, but we have a billion people in the country, so therefore there's so many possibilities for who's gonna go to everything. Yeah. And so film, and as we know it now, in Australia too, we're seeing so much of Indian film which always have music and dance element. So there's no distinction between a musical and an Indian film. It's all embedded inside. So we have wide viewership wide appreciation and in fact in the latest Grammys you would have seen who won that song it was from a Indian film which has its roots in the folk and the classical which people don't necessarily know the Natu Natu song for example. Um, so Jess what about you do you have any favourites that you watch that you think oh yeah I feel like that's very representative of you know what I do? Oh well interestingly I just worked on the biggest grossing Indian film uh, called Brahmastra. Oh my <laughs> god I love that film. <laughs> <laughs> There's, there's little old me in Australia wow, um, awesome. orchestrating the film score uh, for the Indian composers who are, you know, we were communicating with via Zoom and everything else. And we recorded the underscore in Vienna via Zoom. So I was staying up all night telling the, 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 the Viennese musicians how to play all this music written by Indian composers and orchestrated by an Australian. So it's a truly, um, you know, global, uh, you know, commitment <laughs> of, of, you know, people working on these giant movies. But that particular film was really opened up my eyes because we have the Bollywood sequences with the dancing and all the um, traditional instruments which are being recorded in India. 
then I'm writing these sort of Marvel movie style action sequences, you know, for, um, you know, gods and goddesses fighting each other, which are very contemporary Hans Zimmer style, you know, scores as well. And then we have romantic songs as well. And they literally said, we are so sorry, Jess, we're, we've got a session coming up. We haven't sent you anything more to score because we're working on the song because we have to release the song because that's what sells the film and we have to record it in five languages <laughs> so that it can go out there and be, and then it goes on YouTube and I open up YouTube and it's got, you know, one, day one, 1.1 1 .1 million views. By the end of the week, wow. it's 57 million views. And I'm like, wow, that's just beyond that's anything incredible. I've ever done. But it's a three hour film. It has a, an interval. It's only part one. It's finished. <laughs> and that's part one. <laughs> that's part one. So, uh, and there's so much amazing story derived from folk elements and everything in it, and amazing um, actor. The best actors in India are in this film, and just that whole cultural thing was quite amazing. But classical music, of Indian classical music, and then Western traditional kind of mashed up together in this one thing and millions would have seen this film. So. And were you familiar with Indian instruments and range? Or you said it was recorded in India, so was that then provided to you to work with or how did No, that what happened was I got sort of flutes and clarinets and things put in and I scored it all and I sent it off and said, Are you, do you want me to record? It was mainly brass and strings, you know? Uh, and they said, no, 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 we'll take care of all the Indian instruments here, we'll, we'll record them all here. So unfortunately, I didn't get to go to Mumbai. That well, would have been did. nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, they, they had to, there was so much work to do to put all of these elements together. It's a huge job. Um, so do you have any, to go back to the, uh, the question, do you have any favourites that you watch that you go, oh yeah, that's um, very representative of kind of what I do? Oh, yeah, it's pretty hard <laughs> to yeah. find. I, I, things like Fantasia, right. you know, way back when where you actually see the orchestra, <laughs> that's where my little brain was just <laughs> like, ooh, you know, that's the thing that I was interested in. <laughs> you um, just made me think of that famous cartoon where Bug, Bugs Bunny's conducting. <laughs> That's right, yeah. Do you know, my um, pet bugbear at the moment is watching Wednesday with my kids oh, and yes. um, General Ortega. Series. And so many people have said playing to me, is General Ortega really playing the cello? I'm like, God, she had two months of lessons. Why, how on <laughs> earth do you think that she's able to play the cello like that after two months? I've had to fix so many bad performances. I've had to rewrite Beethoven. <laughs> <laughs> because, because the pianist and the cellist are playing in a TV show and their fingers are doing something that is not in the Beethoven. Oh, nice. so I'm, I'm telling this ch wonderful cellist who's recording with me with the screen, I said, I'm sorry, you have to do a trill oh. there in that bar. And he said, but that's, I practiced this. And like, I said, I know, but the edit of the film has the fingers. We, we have to match what the fingers are doing. So we've added stuff to Beethoven. So I have to do this as part of my job. <laughs> <laughs> da, 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 da. Yeah. <laughs> um, I read Simone Young, Sasha, saying somewhere, um, and I think you were making this point too, Emma, about she keeps being asked if um, Kate Blanchett's conducting is realistic, and she's like, <laughs> do people ask surgeons when actors play surgeons if it looks realistic the way they're cutting up bodies? <laughs> yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. It didn't, yeah I think that's, um, it, it was just when Jess was saying that. I mean, I've got these references, but then I'm like, I'm with a real film composer who's done like heaps of stuff in, in studio. But um, one of the presenters I used to work with in London, she'd done heaps of film scores as the singer, as the dub singer in the 90s. And she would tell me all the secrets of like, oh, that, that person got lots of vocal coaching. And then I had to go in and secretly sing it. Um, but there was, she did dangerous like the aria in Dangerous Liaisons, and she said it was the first time that they didn't play the track. They'd got some Romanian soprano to do it and then decided afterwards it wasn't oh, good enough. And then that happens. had played it to Kate and said, can you sing and match her lip movements? Mm. And she said it was the hardest job she ever had to do because oh. he went, all the phrasing was wrong and oh, I was just trying man. to sing. Oh, I, re I rewrote Puccini as well. <laughs> <laughs> For Happy Feet, yeah. when we have a penguin singing oh. Puccini. Oh, man. And of course, we had to make, write, write the orchestra score to fit the penguin. <laughs> so we all, we had 5-8 and 7-8 and Puccini. So <laughs> you just do what you've got to do. To do you ever wonder that these composers are going to start haunting you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, when I was in my 20s, I used to be the arts reporter for the ABC, and one of the issues that was always talked about was attracting new audiences to classical music. Um, it's a perennial issue. It's still talked about all the time. Um, why do you think it, it's always a challenge and it's always an issue that comes up, Jess? Oh, I think it's, there's so much out there. To, I mean, I've got a 16-year-old and a 14-year-old, so YouTube is where they're, they're at. Or, you know, the, but the thing is, I see my kids going, oh, mum, listen to this piece, you know, and they'll bring up YouTube or TikTok, and it's a classical music style piece in a game that, they've, that they love, or a TikTok that's gone around, and I'll say, oh, that's Carmen, or that's this, and they're like, they don't know what these, these pieces are. So through film and television and games, our younger generation are figuring out what Class, what classical music pieces they, they like. They just like the sound of it and don't know what it is and want to find out more. Yeah. So that's a way to get them in. Yeah. And orchestras and you know, ensembles need to kind of open up uh, to the younger generation, otherwise they're going to lose audiences, obviously. So to think of interesting, cool ways of, of presenting concerts to the younger generation is, is definitely what I can see happening a lot. How do you think we make um, the classical arts appeal more prior to, to new audiences? Well, I'm on one track, which is intercultural practice. And I really think that when we say classical, we've really got to think about what classical means from different perspectives and different places. And how do we put those together? We find so many interconnections. And that's what we've actually been doing now for three years with um, the MSO, the Sangam Ensemble, and the platform that we've created uh, opens up uh, audiences to what this intercultural practice is. And I think what we did a few weeks ago at the Sydney Bayer Music Bowl, if the response is anything to go by, that's actually one of the ways forward for how do we look at new forms of music that have existed over a long period of time, but how are we refinding the threads, refinding the connections in the present, and also making it accessible to so many people. Another thing we do is we also look at how music is dance and music is storytelling, and we bring those elements from our practices to work with the MSO and it's been beautiful and rewarding to actually see how those balances can occur and how we're actually able to move and make people feel emotionally moved by what it is that we're doing. Emma? Yeah, I think this is something I've spent a lot of time thinking about, um, particularly during COVID, I think, um, gave us a lot of time to think. Um, yeah, I, I think going back to when I was writing my honours thesis in fourth year at uni, um, I was writing an essay on Benjamin Britten, who's a um, 20th century British composer. And he was writing in the 1940s. And I remember reading one of his letters and he was saying, oh, you know, we've got no audiences. Our audiences are dwindling. No one wants to come to the opera anymore. Our audiences are all so old. Have you been to the opera? Everyone's got gray hair <laughs> and they're all gonna die and then we'll have nobody. And so I, I think this is a perennial issue. I don't think it's something that is new, um, but I think the, the questions and the conversations around how do we get more people engaged is something that is ever changing, particularly in the current kind of digital, digital world and digital landscape. Um, I think that it's about kind of making the link between the film music and the game music and the cultural music, like um, it, uh, intercultural music and other cultures and bringing that all together and like, how do we make a link for people to classical music? Because I think like you were saying, people don't know where it's coming from. They hear Carmen, they go, I like that, but they don't know that it's Carmen. So how do we make that link for people that says actually what you're enjoying is classical music and maybe you'd like this kind of thing. And I think ultimately for me in my journey as someone who studied music extensively, it's for me, the more you know, the more you can enjoy it. And I think it kind of, for me, comes back to education and exposure with an element of kind of empowering people to know what's going on and then make those decisions. I think we look at, um, Take, for example, the MSO does a lot of really interesting stuff with films, for example. Um, so, I don't know, Harry Potter accompanied by the MSO, which is awesome. And you're getting like new, new audiences in through doing that. People who love um, Harry Potter are coming to that. 
but I wonder how many of those people are converting over to be people that come to other classical music concerts and how do we bridge that gap for them? I mean, a couple of points. I know some of my friends who are classical musicians don't like doing the gigs that are the film music gigs. So um, I guess there's a, a question here as well about, it's not necessarily about audiences, it's also about performances. And Because I mean, I know we program thinking about what audiences want, but also it's what performers are kind of willing to play, Sasha. <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting one because um, I think my reference point for this is working in radio that specialises in classical music. And you hear this conversation happening with my friends who are in arts admin and the orchestras or the opera, or even when I was doing those roles. But Classic FM's, um, our breakfast audience was 2.5 million and our station listeners was 5 million. And even 3MBS, which is the local fine music community radio station here, when I was there, their weekly listeners are more people than fit in the MCG. So when you actually think about when you're putting people who are enjoying music into, um, into that kind of scale, are they dying or is it back to this question of like what environments are we welcoming people in mm. to enjoy the music? And, and I would say the same with like when you're looking at um, technology and like uh, Kelly Harlock, who I worked with on that classical podcast, she's head of uh, classical music for Spotify and Peaceful Piano Playlist is one of their biggest podcast playlists. So I do think it goes back to that point that Jess, well, everyone's made is, um, uh, dare I say it, are we kind of inviting a museum culture in some of the more traditional aspects of how we're enjoying, enjoying music? And do we need to look at ourselves and say, um, how are we inviting new audiences? Because there are, people are out there listening. Um, I wonder, um Jess, I mean, I've never seen it, but maybe people do program this. So the, do the major orchestras ever program, like, say, Harry Potter on the same bill as Brahms Symphony No. 3? Because it seems to me like it's pretty kind of ghetto-wised, where it's like, we're having our Disney night, oh, and now yeah. we're doing our series. Oh, if you open the brochure, you know, of the orchestra, they're not going to put the Harry Potter in the brochure. No. The brochure is the master series, yeah. visiting international artists, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So, no, <laughs> it's definitely on a, on a separate you know, um, little thing of its own to attract those audiences. And I think it would be nicer to have, you know, a bit more inclusion. Um, and being a composer, you know, we, we need to have stories of our time. And so inviting composers to write about what's happening around them, you know, today is also really important. I wrote a piece uh, which Emma performed in where I had seven prime ministers on stage who were all pushing and shoving each other <laughs> off the <laughs> stage. <laughs> Uh, which was for Victorian opera, uh, linked to the seven deadly sins. Each city in Australia was a sin. And uh, yeah, Canberra was pride, <laughs> fighting each other. Um, and so those kinds of things, that drew an audience of 2,000 in Hamer Hall. And I've, I've never felt as a composer better when 2,000 people belly laughed and they had to stop the orchestra <laughs> because Julia Gillard had pushed Kevin Rudd off the podium. <laughs> so, you know, those are the things that people also should be seeing, is they should be seeing things written now. Mm. And it was in the time of Beethoven. It was in the time of Mozart. They wanted new. They wanted to see what was happening now. So we can't forget to invite people to, you know, enjoy their voices, voices from our generation. Um, I meant to ask you before, Emma, when you were talking about reading the Benjamin Britten letter about, oh, it's all old, they're going to die off, <laughs> nobody. Um, that, you hear that all the time as well. Did you, in the research for that, did you come up with any reason about, like, do people hit a certain age and then they suddenly are interested in going to see classical music? Or, like, what is the, why does that continue to be a kind of perennial thing where you've constantly got this older audience? Because it must mean that younger people at a certain point are then coming. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I don't know. I just assumed there was a biological gene. <laughs> I don't know, 65, and all of a sudden you've got the time to listen to Marla. Maybe. You know? um, I was going to ask you, um, Sasha, I mean, so we've got these older people that come to classical music concerts, and then so many children learn a musical instrument. And I mean, I have many friends who actually learn instruments to like, you know, grade seven, A must kind of level, and then they just don't play at all now. Yeah. Um, what do you think it is that, that pe sort of young people will often have an instrument as part of their education and then in early adulthood it just drops off? Well, American and you're one high? of them. It's yeah. like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like bullying in high school. Um, yeah. uh, probably has something to do with it. Um, 
I think, uh, well, we used to actually look in it, into it from an audience marketing perspective when I was at Classic FM, and it was actually to do with like the pace of your life. And they used to say that we expect uh, people to start being coming back to the station at around 45, and, and not to insinuate that anyone at 45's pace of life is suddenly like <laughs> chilled as, but um, they said it's that desire to kind of um, find a space of calm and find a space of um, uh, somewhere to um, relax and feel and get away from the news and get away from swearing on the news or swearing on the new songs that are coming out. Um, and I did also read, there's some interesting studies of apparently your musical taste almost freezes in time in your early 20s. So what you listen to up until that period of time is then what you use as a benchmark to grade music against for the rest of your life. So I do think there has to be something to be said of like, all my friends who I studied um, music with in high school still know all the band songs or the arrangements, Pirates of the Caribbean that we did in high school band <laughs> and still love them. And then they love their Harry Styles and that kind of music. And then there's a period where you just kind of enjoy that music forevermore and judge everything else <laughs> against it. That's kind of disturbing because my bank's full of banana <laughs> <laughs> Um Priya, collaboration is, you know, by its nature kind of inclusive. Where do you think are the opportunities for more collaboration between art forms? Well, I think, first of all, when we look historically, we already see that there's been so many intercultural engagements right from the 17th, 16th centuries we see it. Um, even one of the projects we did with the MSO in 2021 was looking at a composition of Johann Strauss the first, which is called the Indianer Galop. And uh, when we were speaking to Ben, uh, I said, you know, do you know why it's called the Indianer Galop? And he said, no. And so I had been doing research on this topic. And so I was, we were talking about how there were actual Indian musicians and dancers that had traveled to Paris in 1838 and then traveled all around Europe, influencing hundreds and thousands of artists from theater to music and dance, and then finally arriving in Vienna in 1839. And Johann Strauss and Josef Lenner were both in the audience. And there's um, archival evidence of this. And then we start seeing both their compositions change. So about 80 to 90 compositions following this encounter have the elements of the music and dance inside Johann Strauss's work. And so what, what are the specific influences that you can kind of hear coming through from that? Particularly the rhythms. So we have something we do with our footwork as dancers. Can I demonstrate? Yeah, go for it. So I have to take off my shoes, which by the way, everyone loves my shoes. Yeah, they're awesome <laughs> shoes. Yeah. But they're not from India, they're from Macy's. <laughs> um, so we have this footwork that we do, which is basically like, foot stamping and we also have these interlocking rhythms that so dancers become musicians in the process of doing this um, performances and this is what seems to have caught Johann Strauss and Josef Lenner's attention the interlocking rhythmical patterns and also the raga scales which is the musical scales that they, the musicians were singing. And so we start seeing, in a way, we deconstructed the Indian Ergallop to look at what raga family could actually be inside the song. And the musicians that I work with, Uttra Vijay and Hari Sivanesan, who are part of the Sangam team and artistic directors, were able to unlock the family of ragas in which it could have emerged. And then we spoke to our collaborators in India who are from the marginal communities that I mentioned, who are actually descendants of these performers who went to Europe in 1838. And they identified for us and said, it's this raga. Mm -hmm. So then we came back to Ben and we came back to the orchestra and we said, this is how we can try it. We can actually go from the raga, which was Ananda Bhairavi, one of our scales, and we wove it into um, Johann Strauss's Indian Air Gallop. You, we have some footage um, at some point. We can have a oh, that's people so want to cool. look that at it. Sounds amazing. So we did that whole journey and that story to show what is possible if we unpack the past, and that's just one piece, and that's just one 
composer. We have things that have gone both directions. Because of colonization, we had so many British bands and orchestras and European bands coming to the courts of the kings where many of these dancers were present and therefore we saw exchanges happening. The violin gets introduced into our form, for example, and the violin is a staple part of the classical Indian music repertoire now and has morphed and evolved in its own way. So there's so many things that are possible just looking at the past, not even looking at the intercultural stuff that is right in front of us here. So we look at both the present, what we can create in this moment, and also the past, and how do we find those moments of connection that bring us together. Jess, I wanted to ask you about the present and maybe the future. You, you spoke before about your kids looking at stuff on YouTube. Mm. What about platforms like, say, TikTok, where they favour uber short form, mm. um, very hooky, straight off the top. Like, where do you think are the opportunities there for music? I've heard things about artists being told that they won't be signed by a record company until they have a TikTok viral oh. hit. Mm. So that, that's a little worrisome because, uh, you know, basing uh, their popularity in, in the fact that they need to go viral first mm. before they can then have a career mm. is, is a little bit, yeah, a bit worrisome for me. Mm. Um, they are very short grabs, so I guess they have to be kind of catchy. Um, it's interesting that there are a lot of formulas out there for writing popular music, like for example, you take a beat and then you add what's called the top line, and the top liners are the ones that make most of the money. Um, and so this is sort of formulaic thing happening in there. But I think the, the diversity that you find is more coming from games. I think, you know, my kids are, well, my, one of my kids is a very avid gamer and into anime. Right. And that has much more cultural interest because there's a game that she plays called Genshin Impact. And in Genshin Impact, there are different worlds. And each of those worlds represents different cultures. And they actually mix a lot of the cultures together. And my kid sends me a YouTube video of a video of everyone playing all these wonderful instruments in, in you know, the sort of Arabic area of, of this um, game world. And so she's learning about this by watching someone's made this video to show this is how we made the music for, and she loves listening to those scores. So then they get picked up by all the anime TikTokers because they're dressing up as the characters in the game and doing their little videos to that music, and it just perpetuates. Right. So there's some incredible creative stuff going on by composers that is infiltrating out there. That's long form, because they're five minute things. Yeah. But the, the TikTok may only pick up a little bit of it, but it leads you down the path into where is this coming from? Oh, look, there's this five minute piece of this. Oh, there's an album. And they're listening to a full playlist then. Yeah, and it's, I mean, the question is, like, often people talk about using things as a gateway into other things, which is kind of how I think, you know, artistic pursuits and, and you know, literature and stuff works. But also, um, I mean, does it matter, I suppose, if you just hook into, say, you love heavy metal and you, that doesn't push you into classical music, even though I actually find those two kinds of music have quite a bit in common. Does it really matter if it's not a gateway into something? If you just enjoy that, if you enjoy game music, yeah, absolutely. I think everyone's sort of into what they're into, and there's also they're you know they're going to find people who are into the same thing, yeah. and find what they're in common, and and they'll talk about what they like, and they'll pass it on. I mean, that's the digital age, isn't it? Um, Sasha, what do you think about the kind of newer platforms and where the opportunities are? Um, I mean, maybe I'm being a bit Pollyanna, but I think there's amazing opportunities. Um, I was at uni at the same time as the two set guys who lots of people know and they've gone on to be um, huge YouTube sensations. Um, and I think as well when you're talking about um, TikTok and, and being served things that it's like, well, if you like this, then maybe you like this, it, that um, journey happens. And I think the other thing about like so much of our listening becoming an individual exercise because Spotify and all, well, all my podcasts are on my phone and I know from a broadcasting background you're always taught to make people feel like it's an intimate experience but music's kind of moving that way too now. It's like your daily drive on Spotify and I'm being specific there but like it's around what you're listening to and so there's no judgment. You're not probably getting bullied for playing the euphonium in high school because you've got your <laughs> playlist 
and you can discover music on your own terms and without other people knowing. So I think um, there are issues with like digital disruption and obviously when you're talking about people getting paid properly and there's lots of things that um, go wrong, but there's also amazing opportunities, I think, if we're persistent and exploring what roads we can go down. Emma, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think um, just on that sort of TikTok thing and it being an individual experience, that's something that I find like potentially problematic with that whole, you know, with the TikTok thing. I know that if I were to be on TikTok, which I have not allowed myself to be, I would never go to a live event ever. I would be <laughs> on my phone just constantly watching TikToks. And, you know, music and creating music and experiencing music, part of the beauty of that is it being a communal experience and it not being an individual one. Yeah, and I think that's a good point. Because I, I do mean it in the sense of exploration, not necessarily totally. that. Totally. But it made me think how it's of supposed that. to be enjoyed. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think it's just made me think. Yeah, just kind of sparking mm. off that made mm. me think about how, you know, there's something so special in the live and the actual connection to a, an audience where, like, we're all in the same room breathing the same air, which is maybe not a good thing <laughs> at the moment. But do you know what I mean? Like, there's something really important about the collective experience that you don't get through digital media. Mm. Well, I guess it also, if you attend something live, I mean, you can choose to get up and walk out, but um, it's, there's a barrier to that, right, because it's socially awkward. And so you're kind of compelled to sit there, which forces you to slow down. And also maybe you don't really like something for the first five minutes, but then it kind of your ear gets in or then you do like it or this comes up to a bit that you enjoy. Um, whereas on a shorter um, form platform, you can just go whoop. Yep. So, um, yeah, I guess that's also... Um, you know, part of the challenge. And that's why I wonder, Jess, if what it will end up favouring is, say, pop songs that have a really, the opening, you know, five seconds will have to be super hooky. Like I was thinking when you were talking about the Peter Gabriel song, Big Time, which I think mm. is a great song, but it's kind of slow to get going because it's got all this kind of, you know, soundscape off the top and then the actual main riff hits maybe, I don't know, 30 seconds in. Mm -hmm. If I was looking at that on TikTok and I'd never heard it before, I would suspect I would have swiped up. Yeah, you have to listen a certain way in and our attention spans are getting shorter and shorter. Hence the wiggles always put the chorus first. Oh, right. <laughs> Because they've got to grab the squirrels yeah. really, really quick. But I was going to say, though, not necessarily, because sometimes people look at the number of views, and mm. therefore mm. if you see that a song or dance sequence has had a huge number of hits, you're going to give it time, and you're actually going to go all the way. At least I do. I go, well, there's got to be something <laughs> as to why people are... <laughs> I do that. What I mean. <laughs> so I think there's Absolutely. also the idea of the, the numbers mm. game mm. does help this particular issue. Mm. But I was wondering if I could address something you said a bit earlier mm. about the gaming world and the intercultural experience that's happening in the gaming world. I just wanted to say, I mean, I don't know if people have thought about this, but there's a danger in the re-inscription of the primitivization, mm. the exotification, the orientalism that is possible in the game world without any kinds of implications mm -hmm. because nobody really knows what you're doing. I mean, I'm just wondering True. about the ethics of yeah. that whole process, which we've spent the second half of the 20th century really problematizing appropriation and I exotification. Think our, our teenagers are actually pretty wily. They're, they're like, they, uh, my child came to me and said, hey, mum, this is really bad thing about this game in that, you know, there's, there's all white, white people in it or whatever, or they're trying to portray this world in this particular way and that's not okay because... Th 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 th. So they're pretty good. They're actually picking up and I think that they're actually... The game, game people have to listen a little bit more to this. And, um, and when I saw that video she sent me, I was like, oh, okay, there's those and this, but it's not really Arabic. It's sort of a mixture of a whole lot of different things. So they're just trying to create some sort of exotic thing, but it's not, they're not particularly trying to pinpoint one area. So it is, it is a little bit problematic, but then I guess the only thing that you could do is use synthesizers to create new sounds, I suppose, and, and create a new world that way. So there's a limit to, I mean, they, everyone wants the next world. You know, pretty quick, the release of that next world is going to get all the subscribers to log in, so they have to do something quickly, and I think that's why they just come up with something, oh, we'll just appropriate this and go with that, and that'll be the next thing. 
So yeah, there's definitely that. But they are quite smart, I think. They are. They do think about it, and hopefully they say they. They're quite, you know, strong about their views. <laughs> 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 they say what they think. I don't have a line of sight to the clock because the camera's in the way. Oh, so Forty-nine, the twenty-two. Forty-nine. Okay. Let me ask one question, and then I'll take some audience questions. Um, I wanted to ask each of you, what do you think are the life lessons that you've found useful? broadly because of your direct involvement in the arts. So I'll give you an example. So for me, because I've always um, played and, and studied musical instruments, I have a very acute understanding that if you practice something that you will get better at it, that it just, it's like night follows day. And that's a useful thing to know when you crap at anything in life, that if you <laughs> keep going, you will be getting better at it. Um, so um, Jess, let me start with you. Oh, the definitely 10,000 hours thing is, you know, definitely part of it. I think it's that you just learn something every day that you, I can never know everything. I'll never know about all the ragas. Like there's so much out there in music. I'll never know all of it. So I'm always learning something new and to be accepting the fact that I'm, I'm never going to be the know-it-all. <laughs> Priya, what about you? What do you think of the lessons you've learnt from the arts that you can use in your broader life? Improvisation. Oh, yeah, of course. The very fact yeah. that you could be doing something and the very next second something can change. The ground can just literally split open. So what are you going to do? <laughs> so literally that, because that is our lives. <laughs> yeah, I do know. I think about that a bit too with um, accepting the offer in improvisation. Um, um, and that is actually, once you've learnt that in, in improv, you realise how often in life someone makes an offer and you block. Um, and so knowing to accept the offer is a good one. Um, Emma? Um, I think for me it's curiosity. And like Jess was saying, there's so much out there. You could, you know, we'll never ever hear all of this music. And um, just, I, I love exploring it. And exploring its um, kind of where it takes me into other cultures, where it takes me into other art forms, where it takes me into other conversations that I might not have had. So for me, it's, yeah, being curious is something that it's given me, yeah. Yeah, Sasha? Um, I think it's actually uh, people skills, and that's because, you know, being in a brass band when you're 17 and you're sitting next to a 70-year-old man who, you know, there's just nothing that I had in common with them except for the fact that we are both playing a brass instrument and um, there's so many situations like that where you're just thrown into an environment and you're just meeting everyone because it's a scratch gig or it's you're all there and you just have to do the task at hand and they might drive you nuts or you might meet your new best friend um, and I just think so many times when I then moved out of the arts and moved into um, just a broader um, like the financial world uh, there's lots of instances where you have to talk to people that I have just nothing in common with. And it's, um, yeah, just been a life lesson. I, it, related to that, <coughs> excuse me, I think also listening, because you can't play music in a group of people if you're not mm. acutely listening. Mm -hmm. And, um, it, you know, it, that kind of does help you develop that school, skill. And I think so many people actually don't know how to listen very well. All right, let me see, um, do any of you want to ask a question of any, any of our um, panellists? Just pop your hand up and feel free. I was wondering what people thought about the effect of Melbourne Digital Concert Hall, or which is now Australian Digital Concert Hall, and to what degree that might help with finding new audiences and retaining old ones. Who wants to take it? Um, I th well, I think it's a. It was a really necessary thing during the time of COVID because I think it provided a lifeline to so many artists um, and, and, and gave them access and the ability to make money and well, still earn their living by working with audiences. Um, I think there's, I personally think there's definitely room for streaming um, and broadcasting of classical music concerts in all its forms. I mean, I've certainly watched things in New York and London and Berlin that I never would be able to afford to go see. Um, so, but I do think it is a, personally, I do find the act of, and I'm not talking specifically about Australian Digital Concert Hall here, but like all streaming, we were saying beforehand, we're all a bit sick of screens and Zoom. And I think to pick up on a point that everyone made, it's there's nothing like the real thing. So I think, yeah, there's no per silver bullet when it comes to streaming. Um, okay, anybody else like to ask something? Yep. Yeah. 
Well, I think I wrote a little Instagram post. <laughs> uh, I teach a lot of, you know, do a mentoring and, and everything, and I'm 48, so if I look back at my 18-year-old self, starting at the Conservatorium of Music, uh, being a composer is a long game. <laughs> <laughs> and you mature and you get better with age, and it's about the journey, it's about what you pick up along the way and those skills that you gather up and to form yourself and you know back then in my 20s it was I spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to make this piece of music work and now at 48 I just go blam <laughs> it's you, out there. Did so. you start out wanting to be a composer? I did right. absolutely but motherhood did get in the way <laughs> slightly but I poured myself into uh, learning the skills and working for other composers working in the studio and that informed my practice. And now, whenever I'm asked to do something, I, you know, get very um, structural about it and know what has to be done. A deadline's a good thing, and I have less less time than I did before. But um, I write better because I know myself better. Yeah. Priya, what about you? What would you give your younger self? I was thinking about that. I would just say to not be anxious every day when somebody doesn't reply to your email <laughs> immediately or your text like within five seconds and not think they hate you. Like really just something very simple like that about not getting anxious about the things that are not happening at the speed that you want it, but actually to put the ask out into the universe and let it come to you in the time that it's supposed to and it will arrive. You just have to have faith and keep going, no matter how many no's, no matter how many non-texts, non-emails <laughs> that appear. Just really faith, I think. Yeah, I, I feel very similar, um, similarly to Priya. Um, the number of emails I've asked Sasha to proofread for me is actually ridiculous. She should get a fee for that. Um, I, I think, yeah, just, you know, it's not a race. And you're not actually, I think that something that classical music world can do is really set up a, a, an environment of competition among peer groups. And I think that that's ultimately a really destructive thing, both for the industry and for people's mental health and for people kind of finding their own path. Mm. And I think um, I would say to my younger self, you know, it's not a competition and you're gonna find your own way and it might not be what you think it's going to be and just relax into that. Um, I'm outside the tent now working in finance, but I would say that your skills are transferable. And like, and I don't mean that um, cynically, but just I've met all my best friends through music. Um, I was really, I had a lot of nervous parents and relatives say, are you sure you want to do a music degree majoring in a euphonium? To which the answer should have probably been no. Um, <laughs> but. Um, like it's, it's your learning and, and everything you take with you. And I wouldn't regret any second in the arts and hope to be back in it one day, but like it's, it's just the most magnificent place to learn. How did you come to learn euphonium? What, how was that your instrument? <laughs> it's a really bad story. It's just that <laughs> I really didn't want the French horn because it was too curly and I panicked and, and decided to line up behind that instead of the trumpet. And then my mum came to pick me up from school and she was like, why? <laughs> why this big, like, because, you know, you're a little girl with this big instrument. But, um, you know, it gives, gives you a bit of character when you're the only girl carrying a big low brass instrument around. And also, I think sometimes what the instrument you're drawn to is just like, it's like your taste in part, romantic partners, you can't kind of help it. Yeah. Right? <laughs> if you like that's the euphonium, feel, yeah. you like the euphonium, <laughs> like that's how it rolls, I'm afraid. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, anybody else like to ask something? Do you want to take that one? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think this is what the collaboration between Sangam and the MSO has already started to do. Hit all those three areas. 
we look at it from an intersectional approach. That's what Sangam does anyway. Um, look at what everything we do intersectionally, and these are the kinds of ways we're um, looking at also different people with different religious backgrounds, people with different gender identities, people who are different sexualities. We include all of that, but we don't necessarily think about it as inclusion, but we actually look at it as representation, what is actually required at this particular moment, given our demographic situation in Melbourne and in other parts of Australia, this is a necessity and it's not an inclusion per se. And I think we've found our relationship with the MSO has progressively moved into this space of equity. This is what we're working towards uh, and we're on this journey. It's still a long road ahead, but if an institution like the MSO takes such a big step, so many other institutions we hope will also do the same and we can start seeing this more and more. Anyone else? Yeah, yeah um, I would encourage you to check out Narabaria composers on the ABC uh, Classic. Um, they put out some recordings um, of the Narabaria program, um, which I'm happily uh, been a mentor with. And Chris Sainsbury is an incredible composer that runs this, um, giving Indigenous composers the chance to work with a classical ensemble and learn how those instruments work. And we've got a very diverse range of uh, indigenous composers coming from all different backgrounds too, um, from jazz and from you know, hip hop and, and, uh, and all just trying it out and writing new things. Um, and it's a really terrific thing that ABC is behind it as well. And you, you're seeing this happening more and more, which is terrific just to um, allow classical music to be you know, used in, in many diverse ways. Yeah, it's a good program. Just, sorry, Emma, wanted to say something first. Oh, sorry, I just want to add one thing to that. Um, I just heard, um, for, I know Orchestra Victoria, who are the orchestra that play for all the ballet and opera gigs, they recently have done a regional tour and a performance of a work for children called, oh, I can't remember the name of it, it was about um, a teddy bear who wants to become a Tilly bear. And so, you know, really integrating um, and kind of, representation right from the early age groups with classical music and making that a safe space, which I think is really great work that they're doing on that. My question is about how do you introduce the music or the thing you ask for the instrument? Yeah. There's a whole cultural class to mm. Absolutely, and it's something that really, I think, holds back classical music, and it's not just within the industry, but it's also within the education system. Um, more broadly, I think that, you know, learning an instrument requires a certain level of privilege in, in Australia. Um, people who have the money to afford an instrument, the money to afford an, um, you know, lessons over a sustained period of time, and lessons are really expensive because most of the teachers are freelance musicians who don't make much money, so they've got to have high rates as well. Um, and then, you know, parents with enough time to drive their kids to lessons and you know then this takes place over a sustained period of time um, because it takes years and years to to learn an instrument so that ends up being a hugely costly exercise just to have the luxury of being able to play an instrument um, I actually just started a job at the MSO a few weeks ago um, running the pizzicato effect which is MSO's um, music in schools program for um, students in the city of Hume and that provides um, instruments and twice weekly tuition for students living in the city of Hume who want to learn a string instrument and all of that is um, covered by the MSO. So I think that's a really fantastic um, program and it's kind of, I guess what I love about, about Pitsy is that it's sort of bringing together like it's teaching music, but it's also bringing all of those other things that come with learning music um, in a group situation. And um, I think that that's a really good um, place to start, but I don't think there's enough of it. And I think that that is part of the reason that we don't have enough diversity and we're having to kind of, you know, almost retrofit diversity into classical music rather than giving it all the attention it needs right from the ground up. But, but I was going to say, with South Asian communities in particular, we have a very different way of understanding the importance of classical music and dance in that many of our children learn from the age of five. 
all kinds of instruments as well as um, vocal singing and in schools and also dance forms. And these are not priced at the level that you'd see uh, Western classical music being priced because it's actually a communal and community effort and it's considered part of our culture and our practice and our way of being. Music and dance and art are not separated from everyday practice and everyday life. So there is no separation. However, the difference is that our students, when they get to VCE, there's no space yet for them to actually bring those 15 or more years of expert training by masters into a VCE, although there's a little, little movements now, certainly not the VCA and certainly no conservatory at the moment in Australia accepts these forms as actually equal, if not superior, I would say, to some Western forms and practices. So in answer to your question, it is possible if the community values it and if they actually think of it as being a part of everyday life and not separate to it. Mm. Emma, why don't you um, wrap up for us? Oh, <laughs> we're at that time already. my secret <laughs> yellow book. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, it's been a delight. Thank you to all our wonderful panellists and to Lee for hosting. Um, I'd like to just thank the City of Melbourne who sponsor MSO's Music and Ideas series, and this is part of that series. Um, so thank you for your support. It is um, very important and much valued. So please, um, thanks everyone for coming. Please join us for a drink. It's really important that you come for a drink or I'll get in trouble. Um, and yeah, a round of applause for our wonderful guests. Thank you.